This is a video uh, to go with the article on primary hyperparathyroidism. Now there are two articles on this subject because it's so important. The primary article is long and complicated and the link is right here in front of you. Um, this article is not parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism light, but in a way it is. So I said it isn't, but that's not really true. This is just the practical side. Um, nevertheless, it's good enough for most people who have a concern, whether they have hyperparathyroidism, and for those physicians who want a little primer and frankly don't want to pour through all of the intricacies I could get into the primary article. Now, primary hyperparathyroidism is a stone-forming condition. It isn't really rare in calcium stone formers. Maybe 5% of them have this disease. And it's a super big deal disease because it's curable. The pretty picture, Alabama gristmill, is really a favorite of mine. And I think after you've gone through the video with me, you're going to understand why I love the idea so much of the river which has always been running past this site and always will. Why this pool caused by the mill dam just so wonderfully says something about primary hyperparathyroidism. Okay, get yourselves together and I'm going to show you a picture. And then I'm going to talk to you about what the picture means for diagnosis and evaluation of someone who might have primary hyperparathyroidism. The picture is hand-drawn. It's not specially gorgeous. It's just the best I could do. And um, what it says is that parathyroid hormone is really a hell of a player when it comes to uh, the mineral system. Parathyroid hormone causes calcium to leave the bone and it leaves with phosphate. So it liberates calcium and phosphate into the blood from bone. Parathyroid hormone stimulates the formation of active vitamin D by the kidney. And that gets the gut to absorb calcium and phosphate at a higher than normal rate. Parathyroid hormone signals the kidneys to reclaim filtered calcium back into the blood. And that is going to raise the serum calcium as well. And then it signals the kidney to lose the phosphate. So what do you get? You get everything that parathyroid hormone can do will raise the serum calcium. And nothing it does lowers the serum calcium. It raises it from its action on bone, its action on the gut through activation of vitamin D and conserves it in the blood by the kidney cells. So everything it does raises the serum calcium. Two things it does raise the serum phosphorus, the bone phosphate, the gut absorption, but the kidneys are signaled by that same hormone to lose the phosphate. So you're going to get a rising serum calcium. That's why hypercalcemia is the very center of primary hyperparathyroidism. Fred, why is it the center? Because the problem is an overproduction of the parathyroid hormone by the parathyroid gland cells. And when that happens, you will raise the serum calcium every way you can and lower it no way. The serum phosphorus can be low, could be normal, because the kidney can supervene against the gut and the bone. What does the disease cause? Well, it causes the blood calcium to go up. It causes bone mineral to be lost. It causes gut calcium absorption to go up and to keep the serum calcium high but constant, the kidneys have to get rid of more calcium, but they are filtering more calcium 
because the serum calcium is high. The amount you filter is vastly larger than any other aspect of calcium handling by the kidney. So because you're filtering more, the urine calcium can go up at the same time that the kidney cells retain an abnormal fraction of serum calcium. That's like the mill dam. The river is running fast in the spring. The river is running slower in the fall. The height of the water in the mill pond won't change unless you raise the mill dam. What's the mill dam? The efficiency with which the kidney cells reabsorb filtered calcium. What's the flow down the river? The filtration of calcium, of course. Huh. Isn't that nifty? Okay, so we have the basic idea that everything about high parathyroid hormone is a high blood calcium. And that's coming because the parathyroid glands make too much parathyroid hormone. What makes the glands do it? They grow. You say, well, boy, Fred, that is really smart. And I'm sorry to say so, they grow. They're called adenomas most of the time. That's a benign tumor. The cells take it into their minds to begin growing. They replicate, they make one gland bigger. In about a third or a quarter of the cases, all the glands grow. Now, if you would like to know about the genes and the cells and why they grow, you can read the big article. If you wanna read the big article, you'll see a whole lot about that, but we're not gonna do it here. They grow bigger, and as they grow bigger, they make more hormones. This isn't cancer, it's benign, but it's bigger and there's more hormone. So you might say, well, what do you see if you're a patient who has hyperparathyroidism? Well, of course, you're gonna see a high blood calcium, always. You are also gonna see a high urine calcium. You say, well, why? Why do I have to see a high urine calcium? Because the hormone stimulates the production of active vitamin D. It's called calcitriol. Calcitriol signals the GI tract. What does it signal it to do? It signals it to absorb more calcium. Second, the hormone signals the bone to give up its calcium. So you absorb more calcium and you lose calcium from your bone. Now, that extra calcium flowing into the blood can graze the serum calcium because of the mill dam, but there's a flow through. This mill dam doesn't stop the river from flowing. It just creates the height of the blood calcium. God forbid you stop the river from flowing, you would drown out the entire countryside. We don't do that. The flow of the calcium from bone and the GI tract goes downstream. But the level behind the mill dam for the serum calcium goes up. That's what you see. High urine calcium. Kidney stones. Bone mineral is lost. So you have low bone mineral density. You can get fractures and you get kidney stones. The blood phosphate tends to be low because the Phosphate reabsorption is reduced by the hormone. What about the parathyroid hormone? Well, the parathyroid hormone doesn't have to be above normal. It's just too high for the serum calcium. Well, what's that? The parathyroid hormone itself is regulated by the serum calcium. I didn't tell you that yet. I'm gonna tell you that right now. So when the serum calcium is high, it would drop the parathyroid hormone, all things being equal. But it can't do that here because the problem is the parathyroid glands. They're too big. They make too much hormone and they are not going to stop. 
So they raise the serum calcium. The serum calcium forces the increased number of cells to make less parathyroid hormone. So the serum parathyroid hormone can be high or it can be normal. But the, the regulator, the blood calcium, is too high. Wow. What if this parathyroid hormone were subnormal? What if it were below normal? It's not primary hyperparathyroidism. That's some condition where the blood calcium has been increased another way. What about just a high serum parathyroid hormone with uh, a, a normal blood calcium? That's low calcium diet. Low calcium diet can make the parathyroid hormone go up. So can vitamin D deficiency. So can reduction of kidney function. All of those can do it. So a high PTH by itself doesn't mean hyperparathyroidism. It's when the serum calcium is high and the parathyroid hormone is not low. Okay, I then go through the fact that there's bone problems, there's kidney calcification, kidney stones, nephrocalcinosis, a fancy word for calcium all through the kidneys. I walk my way through the three ways the, the calcium is raised by parathyroid hormone. How do we diagnose it? Well, we begin with an elevated serum calcium. If the serum calcium is not elevated, don't think about primary hyperparathyroidism. If the serum calcium is elevated, think about hyperparathyroidism and be sure whether it's present or not. The urine calcium must not be low. It's generally high generally high. If it's low, you're in a different league and you can read about it down in this text. I don't want to do that here. Then there are four ways you can get a high blood calcium and it isn't hyperparathyroidism and this really happens. You can be on a thiazide diuretic. They will raise the serum calcium, not a lot, and they will not raise the urine calcium. They lower the urine calcium. So you can have a normal urine calcium and you can have a high blood calcium from a thiazide. So you can't make the measurement on thiazide and diagnose hyperparathyroidism. Okay, lithium. People take lithium because of psychiatric problems. It's important for, for example, uh, depression, uh, bipolar disorders. That mo molecule, lithium atom, it alters the physiology of the parathyroid glands. It causes a situation where um, the blood calcium can go up and the parathyroid hormone can be normal. So it can look just like um, hyperparathyroidism. You must stop the drug to make the diagnosis. Hyperthyroidism, when severe, either the glands abnormal or you're getting too much thyroid hormone, can give you a high serum calcium. So you have to know the thyroid status is okay. And then finally I mentioned serum calcium be high and the PTH is low, that's not primary hyperparathyroidism. That's a bunch of complicated states and you can read about it. What about normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism? I already said that's not a disease that does not exist. The big article talks about why it doesn't exist. Um, it's usually low calcium diet, vitamin D deficiency, and so forth. Practically speaking, what do I do? If I have a stone former and the blood calcium is even a slight bit above normal, which is 10, I measure it three times in the morning between 7 and 9 a.m., fasting, and I measure the parathyroid hormone in the same three bloods three times, and I look to see if it's generally high calcium and generally normal parathyroid hormone. If it's borderline and it's bobbling around, I do three more till I get a good solid average and can say the blood calcium is high or it is not. Of course, I do 24-hour urines, and I won't be bothered looking for hyperpara 
if the urine calcium is low. What else do I do? Well, I want the blood calcium to be high, even slightly above, even 10.3 is enough. And the parathyroid hormone is not low, and there's no obvious reason for this like I just went through with you. What do I do next? I call a surgeon. You might say, wow, that sure isn't exhausting, is it, Fred? The answer is no. Once my job is done, I call a surgeon. But I'm very good at what I do. And I do not ask the surgeon to confirm my diagnosis. I know there's hyperparathyroidism. I want them to cure it. So if they can't find the abnormal glands, it means their surgery failed. If I find what I just said, it is hyperparathyroidism. And I'm not interested about what happened, the surgery failed. This is critically important. The surgeons will do scans and they'll do everything they can to figure out where the glands are. They'll do their surgery well. I will do my part well. And I won't be wrong. Nor will your doctors. Nor will you, those doctors who are listening to me right now. Let me sum this up. It's so important. Primary hyperparathyroidism lurks in the corners of stone disease. It's curable. You diagnose it by finding an elevated blood calcium in the company of an elevated urine calcium, or better said, a urine calcium that is not low, and in the presence of a parathyroid hormone measurement that is not low. I do many blood calciums to be sure. And when I'm done with many of them, all showing a, an elevated blood calcium, non-suppressed parathyroid hormone, urine calcium that is not low, and I've ruled out the few causes, which I will not repeat here, I'm done. The blood calciums have to be done fasting. They need to be done in the morning because that's how normals were done. And that's what I do. Carpentry. Measure twice. Cut once. I may measure six or eight times. And I want the surgeon. Cut once. What I like back from a good neck surgeon to whom I send my patient is simply one word. Done. Hope you like the article. Tell your friends. Read the article. It doesn't get a lot of reads. As for the big article, I love it. It's worth reading. However, it's not easy going. Bye-bye. I'm Fred Coe. Thanks for listening.